Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Tech in Today's Schools, What EdTech Vendors Need to Know. We appreciate everyone joining us today. Before we start the program, there are just a few housekeeping items I'd like to review. You may ask questions anytime during the presentation using the online question feature. We'll hold a Q&A period at the end of the program, but feel free to send in your questions as they come up. I'll put them into the queue to be answered by Anne during the Q&A at the end. To use the question feature, simply click on the questions tab on your control panel, type your question into the top box, and then click on the send button. I'll get that and then, as I said, put it in the queue to be answered at the end of the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, please use that same question feature to get my attention and I'll do my best to resolve the problem. We will be providing you with a recording of the webinar as well as a copy of the PowerPoint slides, so keep an eye on your inbox for a link to those later today or tomorrow. We'll also be posting them on the Agile website, which is www.agile-ed.com. We're very excited to hear from Ann McMullen today. She has a lot to share with us um, and a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to hand the program over to her and we'll get started. Emily, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to join you and uh, all of the group who has joined us today for this webinar, and I appreciate your work in putting it together, and happy to meet all of you virtually this morning. I want to share with you our objectives for today. We are going to cover three areas. I want to take a look at a brief history and the status of how school districts are working to leverage technology tools for learning. And then we're going to spend some time looking at the full scope of what it does take to implement technology tools for learning in classrooms and schools and school districts. Mm -hmm. And finally, I'm going to conclude by sharing some tips that I think savvy vendors need to know and do really to assure that their school clients can be successful in launching whatever digital uh, mm -hmm. product or device you are working with with your districts. So we are going to move ahead. One of my core philosophies is that whenever we have more than one person in a room, I really believe that our collective knowledge is much more powerful than anything any one of us can uh, think about on our own. So the notion that the smartest person in the room is often the room itself is something I really believe and I hope that you will join me in that thinking today and understand that collaboration is really the key to our success wherever we are in this journey with putting technology in schools today. So I want to give you a couple of options for participating uh, both live and then after the webinar today and for those who end up participating in the recorded version. During the webinar today, uh, Emily already mentioned that the question feature is there for you to answer or to re request questions that we address later at the end. But we will also have a chat running, and you are welcome to put your thoughts and comments in chat, and we will be referring to those from time to time during the webinar. We are going to have three different poll survey questions seeking your thinking and your input on some of the topics that I'm going to cover today. So I hope you will participate in those polls as they come up. And then for those of you who handle social media so well, uh, you are welcome to tweet on this presentation either during the presentation or after and you see that the Twitter handle for Agile is at Agile Ed and my own is at Ann underscore McMullen. And then as Emily mentioned, we will have the Q&A at the close of the session today and again look forward to your thinking on that. To follow up later, you may again uh, respond on Twitter or through your LinkedIn channels or by email or phone, and you see those uh, numbers will be at the bottom of the screen as we go through this today. And then I will be sharing some resources at the end of the webinar for you to do for further research and knowledge on the topic. So I welcome your participation today. I want to start and give you a little bit of text a context rather about my own journey in this process. So this is the 45 second Anne McMullen story. So hang on. I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, ultimately moved to Austin, Texas, where I got married, had two children, and graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. We were shortly after my second child was born, transferred to the Houston area where my husband was working at that time. And I began my career in education in the Houston area with the Klein School District, which is located 
just north of downtown Houston. And today, Klein is a district of about 50,000 students and 40 campuses. And I worked there for a little over 30 years. I started out as an eighth grade U.S. history teacher and did that for 18 years in the district and absolutely loved teaching and really did not expect to leave the classroom in my education career. But in the mid-90s, I started using computer technology with my eighth grade history students. And because I was one of the first teachers in the district to use technology in a non-tech course, the leadership at the district asked me to come over to the central office and to start working in the technology arena to think about how we use and leverage technology for learning. And so my last 16 years in the district, I had the opportunity to build an educational technology team that worked with the IT department and the curriculum department and principals and teachers to build a professional development organization and to figure out together how we leverage technology to make learning relevant for our students today. And that was a joyful experience. But those two children that I mentioned that were born in Austin ultimately grew up and uh, both ended up living in Los Angeles, California. So after coming to Los Angeles several times to visit them on holidays, my husband and I, when he retired, decided that we would move to Los Angeles, which we did in September of 2013. But because I thought the conversation around technology in schools was still so critical, and I didn't want to no longer be engaged in that process, I started my own consulting business in Los Angeles, and I have been working since that time with school districts, with nonprofits, with vendors on helping to really maximize the use of technology in schools in appropriate ways that make sense for our teachers and our students. So that is my journey. So as I mentioned, we have three objectives we're going to cover today, and I would like to get into the first one, which is to take a look at a brief history and the current status of how technology is being used in schools. So when we look at the evolution of technology in schools. Really, in the late 80s and early 90s, we began to see technology growing in school systems, but it was primarily focused on specialized technology courses, things that you might have found in the career and technical education departments, and not so much in the regular ed areas. But in the mid-90s, with the explosion of the internet and the availability of content to come via the net, to classrooms, we began to see some early adopters in the 90s and the early 2000s start to use technology for learning with students in classrooms K-12 to in multiple content areas. It was not widespread in the beginning, but it is an evolution that has continued to grow. As we have seen the rise of digital content, both inside schools and in what I call the real world outside of school, that has certainly had an impact on how we use resources that might have formerly been textbooks or teacher's editions. We're now seeing those kind of things coming digitally, and that is having an impact on schools and the way that they use technology for learning and teaching. In the last few years, we have also seen a lot of conversation around the urgency around STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and recognizing that as important as those fields are, so too are the arts. And I have to say, as a former social studies teacher, I would add, so too is social studies. But the emphasis around STEM and STEAM is a, a conversation that continues to grow, and that also is driving the use of technology in multiple content areas in schools. And the whole conversation around accountability and assessment, as assessments have moved online and online testing has grown, and the availability of doing formative assessment online, that too has driven uh, the cause of technology in our classrooms. Because of that, and because all of those resources are becoming so much more important, a conversation that is really bubbling up in the last year or two is this concept of digital equity. Because if we're going to provide our resources for learning via the web and via technology tools, then we have to assure that all of our students have that access. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that as we move on today. 
So I want to pose a question to you this morning. When you look at the schools in your community, or excuse me, this afternoon where you may be, when you look at the schools in your community or the ones that you cover for your business, and you do an estimate, what percent of the schools are you seeing that are really maximizing the power of technology to meet the learning needs of all students? Again, in the area that you live or that you serve, are you thinking that's around 75 to 100 percent, which would be choice one, or maybe in the mid-range 50 to 74 percent, which is option two, or 25 to 49 percent of the schools are really getting there, and that would be option three, or is it really just about a quarter or less? And Suzanne, I'm going to ask you to pop the poll so that our participants can vote on that question today, and I'll wait about 30 seconds for responses. And Emily, as you see those responses come in, when you think we're done, if you would share with the group and with me where the answers fell in that poll, that would be great. Absolutely. So it looks like the majority, 57% of folks, um, are in that 25% to 49% range of technology usage. We've got about 2% who are at the 75% to 100%, and then 7% of our audience um, selected that 0 to 24%. So 25% um, to 49% was the majority. Okay, thank you, Emily, and let me try and get that back on screen for us. So um, I think the, the takeaway there is that we still have lots of work to do. Uh, we need to get to that 75 to 100%, and actually 100% is our target. And hopefully together uh, we can make that happen sooner rather than later for our students. I want to share with you some data from Project Tomorrow. Hopefully many of you are familiar with Project Tomorrow. Uh, they do the annual speak up survey in the last quarter of every year from about September to December. And so these results are from their most recent survey. And uh, again, the link is provided for you to look at it in more detail later. But what you can see here is that even as we are increasing technology in schools, what is not changing at a rapid pace is the method for teaching and learning in schools. And you can see that the traditional classroom model was the uh, majority that they got when surveying students, teachers, parents about the model that is being used in schools. So again, the message to ed tech vendors and to ed tech leaders is that we've got some work to do and we need to figure out how to do that together. All right, and let me get to the next slide, let's see. Okay, Emily, we are not moving ahead, there we go. Very good, thank you for your patience with me. This slide gives us a look at uh, the vision for the use of technology in schools. And this one happened to be with principals, teachers, parents, and students in grades six through eight. And as you look at their perceptions and their vision of what it needs to be, you can see that we're not all quite on the same page. When we look at access to internet school-wide, Interestingly enough, it was principals and students who came up with the highest response for that being a priority or vision for them. When we look at games in school, I don't know that we are surprised that students in grades six through eight seem to outpull their counterparts as far as principals, teachers, and parents in the use of gaming in school. That may stick to uh, the point that perhaps we all need to learn a little bit more about how to leverage gaming uh, for academic purposes in schools. And you can see there with e-textbooks a little closer, over 50% for all four groups. The use of tablets in schools seemed to be something that the students were more prevalent in requesting than the others. And then a look at online classes, we're not quite there yet, at least with that group. Again, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the work that Project Tomorrow does and their speak up data, which is available to you to look at their reports. And I'll be giving that as a resource uh, at the end today. Okay, Emily, I may need you to click to next slide. Let's see. All right, let's take a look through this for just a moment as we look at uh, 
actually classrooms and learning. And if we look at this first picture, what you see is look at school as it looked at the turn of the last century. And Emily, I'm going to need you to click it. Thank you. And then as we look at this next slide, we see what school looked like probably in the middle of the 20th century, around the 50s, 60s perhaps. The next picture takes us maybe to the end of the last century. The difference is it's in color, but again, uh, not a whole lot of change over these three pictures. And finally, the last picture shows us a school where technology is in place in the classroom, and we have the computer technology there. But again, we're not seeing a huge shift in the way teachers and students look in that classroom. It may be a different scenario depending on what the students are doing, but oftentimes what we see when we put technology in classrooms is that uh, not a whole lot changes. Uh, the worksheet that perhaps they were doing on those desks on paper now becomes a PDF that they can do online but that really doesn't change much. I have used the phrase worksheets under glass when we simply take what we've always done and put it on a screen. So our challenge is to really leverage this technology to allow us to do something different. So I'd like you to think about this conundrum. If investing in technology for student learning doesn't really change what we are doing, then why bother? And what does it really mean when we talk about transforming learning and teaching through technology? And what is your personal vision? One of the challenges we all face is that in the school business, when you try to leverage change, everyone has been to school. So everyone has a vision and maybe even considers themselves somewhat of an expert in school. So that vision is important and we'd be curious to know your own vision. And as technology becomes more ubiquitous, less expensive, easier to use, what's the holdup? Why is it taking so long? So I'd like to pose another question to you and get your thinking on this. Understanding that probably all of these choices play a part, but from your perspective, what do you see as the major impediment to leveraging technology in school in order to maximize success for all students? Is it number one, money, budget? Is it number two, visionary leadership? Or number three, the reliability of technology tools? Or number four, the knowledge and the will to change what we've always done, or perhaps something else? And if you choose number five, other, I'd like you to just enter in the chat what that other might be. So Suzanne, again, if you would put the polling uh, option available to our viewers, and then Emily, when you've got some results, please share them with me and with the group, and I'll wait just a bit for that. Thank you. So it looks like our overwhelming response at 45% is knowledge and will to change what we've always done. <laughs> um, we had 13% at visionary leadership, which is related, um, and then the 18% at money and budget, 5% um, at the reliability of technology tools, and then we did get about 18% of people who are saying, other, um, and many people chose other because they feel that it's um, both one and four, so money and budget right. and the knowledge and will to change. Um, also, we got ability to understand the impact on the various visions and technology um, available, systematic controls and boundaries. Um, so, yeah, that's what folks Great. have to say. Thank you. Yeah, it's sort of... Uh, substantiates the notion that money doesn't solve everything and that sometimes the will gets in the, the way of, of moving forward. So we have to work on that. Um, one of the things I'd like to do with you this morning is very quickly do what we in the education field call a compare and contrast event. And I want to take a look at what might be viewed as a traditional classroom, even though it is coming from a fictional classroom. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this scene from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, and the anyone, anyone scene. As you watch that, though, think about is that scene something that is taking place even today in some of our classrooms? And then we'll look at a different classroom. So let's take a look 
from this. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Okay, those faces tell it all, I think. They really do. And um, I'd be curious, and you can relate in the chat, if you think that's a situation, again, even though fictional, maybe a, a sad reflection of the way learning happens today. I'd like to show you another example. This is from a high school geometry class in Klein ISD, my former school district. And you'll see a number of different technologies in place there. So let's take a look at that as well. Here at Klein Oak High School, we are applying the one-to-one -one initiative, so every student has a laptop with a stylus. And the fact that the students have a stylus, that really helps us use the tablets in math courses. Because in math, we are constantly drawing shapes, or we're constantly writing equations, or solving uh, for a variable, or graphing a line. In today's class, what we had were four stations, and each station focused on different technology, but it focused on the same concept that we learned uh, the day before. Uh, station one was um, where six students were with me, and we used Dino Vision, and the students joined the session. So I wrote on the screen, and it appeared on all of their screen. And then after that, what I had the students do is I had them download the homework so they could go ahead and get that document on their computer, and then go ahead and start it and uh, complete a few problems. And then from there, they would move to station two, which was a starboard activity. And what students had were uh, multiple problems, a column of 45, 45, 90 problems, and then a column of 30, 60, 90 problems. And all they would really do is they would just drag the pieces to complete the triangles and the blinks that correspond with those specific triangles. So after station two, they would move to station three, and at station three, they would actually be competing against each other, three against three, using line point quiz show. And basically what they did is they would use instruction clickers and a problem would appear, and they had 20 seconds to complete the problem once the first person made a choice. So everyone would give an answer, and then would move on to the next problem. And it basically just did a very quick and interactive activity so students were able to compete against one another. And then they would move on to station four, which was actually using the starboard hardware, but what we're actually doing for the students to actually teach each other is they would stand up and ride on the starboard with uh, PowerPoint. The one thing I like about the stations is it allows the students to move a little bit instead of, you know, sitting there for 50 minutes, which I think is struggling for most people, even myself. But the benefits for the students is that they get to work on a specific content in a different environment. Even though it's only for 10 minutes, they can move on, and now instead of playing a game against one another, they actually have to stand up and they have to teach to the other five students. And then they can move and they actually get a chance to work with me while it's not one-on-one. -on -one, it is one with six, so it's more focused in that group. Um, I think that's really beneficial, just seeing that different environment with one particular content. Yes, that's perfect. Divide by two, multiply by the square root of three. If you can use technology to humanize the classroom, in other words, students, are you know, acting and talking and participating in the classroom. I don't care if every student has a tablet or what kind of software we're using, you can use it to benefit the student and, like I said, to humanize the classroom environment. So clearly a big difference there. I'd like you to think about what it took for him to be able to do that. And here are just some ideas uh, for him to be able to implement the technology the way Mr. Richards did. Obviously, it takes a reliable infrastructure. In his case, he did have a device for every student. That device has to be reliable, both the hardware and the software. 
professional learning and support is huge because it is a change. And as we said in the previous poll, changing was the part that was difficult for many people. He had to have permission to try, that it was okay to try it. If it didn't work, adjust and, and do that. And that required approval and support, both from his school and from his district administrators. Another piece was that he communicate clearly with the students and with their parents about what was going on in the classroom. Because again, that's a very different environment than perhaps what most parents might have experienced in school. And there may be some other ideas as well. And again, I encourage you to mention those in the chat. But clearly, more than simply buying a product and putting it in place had to happen. So that leads us to our next section on what is the full scope of what has to happen and how do you as a vendor need to help your clients understand that scope. Because really that is a very critical part. If your product is going to be successful, then you've got to help educate your clients on the full scope of what it means and what it takes to have a successful implementation. Because the sad news is that if you don't do that and if the technology initiative fails, typically where that hits is in the headlines, and it is a bad news headline. And unfortunately, those bad news headlines are the gifts that keep on giving. They don't go away after the first day that they're published. And so, and it isn't just the school or the teacher or the product that suffers. All of us who are trying to move this process forward can take a hit when there is a failure in a school. So it is critical that you do your due diligence in helping your school customers understand the full scope of what it's going to take to be successful with whatever product it is you're providing to them. So I want to share with you one resource for your own and also for the schools to use because this is a very powerful resource and it is free for school districts to use from the Alliance for Excellent Education and the Future Ready Schools program which they have created in conjunction with the Department of Ed's Office of Educational Technology. What this tool provides is an online assessment for schools to do to look at where they are with their readiness to implement technology. And what it does so beautifully is look at the full scope. They call it the seven gears, the pieces that have to be operating in sync for technology to work in a school system. And the districts work through a self-assessment, and once they have completed that self-assessment using the rubric that is created for them as a guide, they then receive a report that identifies certain gaps that they may have and strategies to suggest that they use to fill those gaps. A template for an action plan based on their assessment is also provided. But what comes through loud and clear in the work of the Alliance for Excellent Education and the Future Ready Schools program is the fact that this takes a leadership team from multiple departments to put this together. I think in the early days of technology, one of the mistakes that we might have made is that we thought really since this was technology, then the IT department needs to be the one to make the call. What we know now is that it does involve the IT department, but it involves many other departments as well. And this uh, assessment helps work school districts through that process. So I want to give you just a very quick overview today. You are welcome to take a look at it yourself, and I do strongly encourage you to have the school districts that you work with take a look at it. Many of them probably have, in fact, over 2,000 superintendents have already signed what is called the Future Ready Pledge that gives them access to this free tool. But you can see in their diagram what this is is a process. And it is a continued process for collaborative leadership around visioning, planning, and then implementing that plan, assessing how it worked, refining it, and then starting the process all over again. So you're never done. It keeps evolving. Technology changes. Students change. Circumstances change. So this has to be an ongoing process. The focus of the whole process is personalized student learning. And what you can see here are some of the highlights from that. And it talks about the fact that we need to connect each student so that he or she is shaping their own academic path with the guidance of the teacher and enriching their education. And that we, with personalized learning, which honestly we could not do before technology, but we have wonderful tools to do that now that we provide each student with targeted instruction, practice, and the support that they need, 
that we begin to look at flexible learning environments. Perhaps the learning doesn't just take place for 45 minutes in a given class period. Perhaps it goes on at other times, and we look to how we leverage technology to do that. And also connect the students with people outside the walls of their class, bring in the community and even the global community as a resource for students. So focusing on that personalized learning as you work through that process is a real key to the success in this. So very quickly going over the seven gears that they talk about in the Future Ready Schools framework process. First of all, the curriculum, instruction, and assessment folks. The bottom line is that in many school districts, particularly the larger school districts, it is the Department of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment that really determines the what of how it is going to be taught in each of the classrooms by establishing the curriculum that teachers will follow. And you can see some of the highlights from the framework are the concept of 21st century learning skills those four skills that we've been talking about since the last century around communication, collaboration, creative problem solving, and critical thinking, and embedding those into all content areas. The notion of personalized learning, of collaborative relevant learning for our students, and how to leverage that technology. That discussion has to happen with the folks in charge of curriculum in any district. And then the use of data analytics to know where we are with our students and where we need to go. That discussion, again, with your curriculum leaders and your principal is critical and teacher leaders as well. The other thing that we need to consider is our use of time and space. And this goes back to the earlier comment about if we're putting in all this technology but it doesn't change anything, then why bother? So. Under the use of time and space, the framework asks school leaders to think about flexible learning, time anywhere, new pedagogy, new strategies of instruction, like you saw in Mr. Richard's example in his classroom, possibly even new schedules for learning, the environments that we have to create for personalized learning, and we're hearing more and more around competency-based learning, meaning that we don't just rely on seat time, but when students prove that they know something, they can move on. We're also seeing this notion come out in professional learning for teachers as well, that the notion that we have to grab everybody together and put them in a room for three hours and call it PD, we know that's not working anymore. So we're personalizing learning for our teachers as well in a variety of formats and letting them demonstrate competency rather than having to do seat time. And again, the other that you see there are strategies for providing extended time for projects and collaboration. And then clearly, when you're working with technology, you have to give thought to the technology that is in the school system and its infrastructure. And honestly, these were things school leaders didn't have to think about 20 years ago, but it is a high priority today. And you, as a vendor with expertise in that area, must help educate the technology leaders and decision makers that you work with and help them to educate others on this process. Data and privacy is something that is in our national conversation more than ever today. The issue around student data privacy really started to percolate up probably three, four years ago. So that is a conversation that you need to be knowledgeable about and have that conversation with the clients that you work with. If the system you're providing requires student data, then you need to be able to talk to the student, the education leaders about how they're going to deal with that data and how we are going to keep it secure. This is simply a fact of the hyper-connected world that we live in today, but it becomes even more critical when you are dealing with children and minors. And so it's an area of expertise that we all have to have. Community partnerships. This is a piece where I think, oddly enough, those of us who are involved in education in the learning business sometimes forget that we have to educate a broader community, people outside of our teachers and our students in our classroom. And I think sometimes this is why we take the hit in the media that we do, because we haven't educated a broader community around what we are doing. 
So one of the best tools that you as vendors can give to your clients in the school districts is some sort of marketing tool to talk that they can use to talk to their community about the product that you are providing for them and how that product is going to be used and why it is a better tool to use than what they have always used in the past. So anything that you can provide to help with parent communication and I would say even the business community in the areas that you serve and to help the district with their own brand around being an innovative district around the use of technology will really be helpful to that district. It's a serious conversation that you need to have with your district leaders as you begin to work with them on implementing whatever technology tools you are bringing to the table. And personalized professional learning, I hit on that just a little bit earlier. Um, teachers and administrators and vendors need to all share the ownership and the responsibility for teachers getting the skill sets that they need to implement the technology tools. And again, it is critical to keep in mind that the training cannot be just about the tool itself, where to click and how to turn it on. In fact, in this day and age, that should become intuitive. One of the discussions that I have with many vendors is that if you're selling a product that's going to require three hours of professional development for teachers to even learn how to bring the product up and use it, you may want to rethink that. Because again, when we step in the outside world, look, for example, at something like the enormous success of Amazon.com. Nobody needed three hours of professional learning to figure out how to use Amazon.com. It was intuitive. Mm -hmm. And the same should be true for the teachers that you're working with and the products that you are providing for them. You need to help them grow that 21st century skill set that we talked about earlier for students. That applies to teachers as well. But we need to begin to present multiple opportunities for teachers to learn and to embrace whatever product it is that you are providing for them. The notion of professional learning networks is beginning to grow and to leverage tools like Twitter chats and LinkedIn conversations for teachers to do their PD in that format is something that we will see continue to grow. So it needs to be broad-based and we need to be uh, inclusive in our participation of teachers in this personalized PD and let them have a role in choosing where they need to go. And obviously the topic of budget and resources. We need to be very careful about how we use the limited dollars that are available for educating our children. It is such an enormous investment in the future of all of us, but those resources are limited. So we have to help our school partners use their resources in ways that really give them a strong return on their investment but also allow them to sustain it. So when you sell the product, you do want to talk about sustainability. What's going to happen next year, two years out, three years out with this product? What is our plan for sustaining and moving forward? So again, another critical conversation that vendors need to have with their clients. All of these concepts around the framework, those seven gears, come together in a spirit of collaborative leadership. And you can see the points highlighted there. Forward thinking, a culture of collaboration, high expectation for evidence-based transformation. And that's something, again, you as vendors need to help your school clients know how are they going to show evidence that the product they purchased from you has had an impact and has made a difference. And you will need to help navigate that path for them. As we begin to wrap things up, I want to share with you some thoughts and tips that really all savvy vendors need to know and do as you work with your school clients. One is the issue around language. The reality is that when you are navigating the education field, there are so many terms out there. And quite honestly, some terms can mean different things to different people. LMS, our learning management system, is one example. If your product is a learning management system, you want to be really clear that what you are selling is matches with what is in the mind of the educators you are dealing with, because they may have a different vision of what it means to run an LMS. So you want to have that discussion. 
We talked about personalized learning. That may mean different things to different people. For some, it may mean differentiated instruction. For others, it may be individualized learning. So again, you just want to be sure that when you're talking with people and you're using these types of terms, that you're all on the same page. If something is standards aligned, what does that mean? Describe your process for being standards aligned and be sure that that is how your customers perceive it as well. Now, as challenging as words and phrases are, in the education arena, we live in a world of what I call alphabet soup. We are the best at coming up with acronyms, and they are all over the place. And this is another example of how you need to be sure that if you're talking about a product for ELL students, is the state that you're working in using that term ELL, or in their area, is it ELD, or perhaps ESL? So as you navigate the acronyms, always define them for the people you're working with, or ask them, if they tell you, we need a SPED product, what does that mean to them? Who's gonna use it? How will it work? And friends, I have to honestly admit that as glorious as the education community is in coming up with acronyms, the technology community does so as well. And so when you begin to put education and technology together, you have acronyms all over the place. And again, not to belabor the point, but we just need to be sure we're all speaking the same language and that these acronyms make sense to everybody involved in the conversation. I'm going to wrap up today before we get to the Q&A with some P's and Q's, minding your P's and Q's, and we're going to look at the P's first. These P's are essential for your toolkit as you work with school districts. Clearly people, and we've talked about that quite a bit, going to hit on it just briefly again, looking at policy, procurement, programs, and the concept of a partner. So let's start first with people, and this will be our last poll survey today. I'd like to ask you, who is your normal initial point of contact when you're first attempting to connect with a school or school district about your product? Is it number one, the superintendent? Or perhaps it is number two, either the chief information officer or chief technology officer, the person in charge of the IT department? Or perhaps the chief academic officer, the person in charge of curriculum instruction and assessment? Or maybe your entry into a school district is actually through a school and you're dealing with the principal or the teacher. Or again, if there's an other, please go ahead and put that in the chat as well. And Suzanne, if you'll bring up that poll one more time for our participants. And Emily, I'll wait on you to let me know when we have some responses. So it looks like we have a tie at 26% for both chief academic officer and the principal, um, followed with 18% um, the chief information officer or the CTO, and then a tie of 15% for superintendent and teacher. We did actually have a couple people um, write in media specialist as well. Interesting, and yeah, and I appreciate that, and I think that uh, the media specialist, formerly known as maybe the librarian, is another great entry point, and librarians or media specialists are doing such a great job in leading this transformation in schools, and uh, they are uh, critical to that process as well. So it's interesting to me that the initial point of contact is typically a principal or a teacher. Uh, I see real value in that because those are the two people most directly responsible for what happens in a classroom. And so that's a good starting point. Um, and it's interesting that many of you had that as your number one or number two as well. So just always good to know for your product, who is the best person who you need to meet with to have that initial conversation. When we talk about policy, uh, I particularly want to call attention to the recent uh, Every Student Succeeds Act that was passed in December that is 
now taking over for what we knew as No Child Left Behind and prior to that the ESEA, the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. As a vendor, it is critical that you understand the policies that are driving decisions in schools and in districts. And this national policy around ESSA is a real game changer for us. I want to give a plug and a suggestion that if you did not see the uh, Agile Marketing webinar by Stephen Rowley on this topic, I've provided the link and I encourage you to go back and view his webinar. He really did a great job in taking the policy walk conversation and putting it in real terms that we can understand, use, and leverage. Just a couple of highlights of what Stephen covered in his uh, webinar for Agile. One is he said that the new policy has a continued push for individualized instruction, as we had talked about earlier today, and that high academic standards are still going to be required but they are now pushing them to the states to come up with those standards, and states are going to be required to adopt, implement, and assess their own standards. That is a huge shift back from the No Child Left Behind era. We also see that there is a continued trend to connect early childhood education, such as pre-K and Head Start, with the whole K-12 system. Another game changer is the notion of highly qualified teachers, which was a part of NCLB. That too is now being handed back to the states, and the states are going to be responsible for coming up with their own criteria for professional uh, certification for teachers in their states. The accountability for <clears throat> English language learner instructions has now moved to Title I, and for special ed, there is an increase uh, emphasis on access to general education and uh, assessment adaptability. Again, just some brief highlights of Stephen's work. I encourage you to go back, take a look to learn more about ESSA. The bottom line on this new policy, as you can hear, is that it is basically turning the policy uh, agenda back over to the state. And so for you as a vendor, your challenge will be that if you're dealing with 50 different states, there may be 50 different policies that you're going to have to look at. I think there's going to be overlap, and I think even Common Core, which has kind of suffered its own backlash, uh, will probably still run as a strand as a model for standards that states will be adopting. But I want to provide this tip for you as you are trying to wrap your arms around this notion of every state having their own responsibility for standards assessment and accountability. And that is that I would encourage you to get to know the person in charge of government relations or the legislative liaison for any one of the major organizations that deal with this arena, particularly COSIN or ISTE, either one, typically have local state affiliates, and those state affiliates have legislative liaisons. They should become your new best friend when it is time to learn about policy in the state and where things are heading. And they can also direct you for help with individual school district policy as well. So this is a little different in policy environment for all of us, one that we will come to understand better in the 16, 17 school year and beyond, but something we do need to know more about. Procurement is something that I know you as vendors understand all too well. When I looked up the definition of procurement online, you can see this is one that I got. It's a quite complex process. In the school business, procurement can often mean working with an RFP, then uh, directing your costs to match the specifications in the RFP, developing that contract, then delivering the product, looking at the quality of what you have, assuring that your compliance issues are there with procurement. I know it's a huge deal for vendors. I've heard that repeatedly, but it is the reality of the world we live in, and navigating the procurement path is something that every vendor needs to develop expertise in. And finally, some programs in place that can help you and that you need to use to understand the bigger picture of where we are in this whole ed tech environment. Certainly the National Education Technology Plan for 2016 that was released recently out of the Department of Ed Office of Educational Technology is a must read for anyone in this field. It will help give you the language to communicate with your customers but also understand the national vision. 
other things coming out of the National Office of Educational Technology at the Department of Ed. The President's Connect Ed initiative, which I'm sure many of you already know about. If not, you want to take a look at that to see how they are leveraging major corporations to help assure that we have this digital transformation in all of our schools. A more recent campaign out of the department is the Go Open campaign, which focuses on open education resources and how districts can leverage those resources as a tool for learning. The Future Ready Schools program that I mentioned earlier also has a role in the Department of Ed, and you'll want to look at that in their Office of Education Technology. We talked earlier about student data privacy. If you want to know more on that, one good resource is from COSIN, the Consortium for School Networking. They've done a lot of work around protecting data privacy, and I encourage you to take a look at their report. They have most recently done a lot of work around digital equity, and that is a focus for them going forward. In fact, both the Future Ready Schools program and COSIN and others have been working with the FCC on an upcoming change to a program called Lifeline, which gave a discount for telephone communication to families in need, and now that is looking to be expanded to broadband access in homes as well. That vote is actually coming up the end of this month on March 31st with the FCC, so you'll want to stay tuned to see how that program is enhanced and changed. And finally, on the issue of partners, I just can't sing this song often enough. It is critical that as an ed tech vendor, you view yourself as a partner with the school or the school district that you are working with. It is much more than a seller and buyer relationship. And it cannot end when the order is in and the check has been received. You have got to continue to travel the path with the schools that you are working with in all the ways that we have discussed today to help assure that your product is the success that you want it to be in that school or that school district. And more and more, I am seeing partners among vendors themselves. So in today's business climate, there may be another vendor who has an area of expertise that you don't have, but that fits nicely with the work that you are both trying to do. So the partnerships with other vendors, I'm not talking about buyouts and taking over companies, but really just a collaborative working atmosphere is something I encourage vendors to do. So we've covered a lot today, and we are going to wrap it up and get to the questions. I would just say, as daunting as the task seems, it is critical. It is important for our future as a nation, for our future of our students. And so we need to just keep fighting the good fight and making sure that we do this for our kids. I'm providing you with a number of resources to do after this webinar. I've already discussed with you the Alliance for Excellent Education. I encourage you to look at their Future Ready Schools program. COSIN, we just discussed around digital equity, and student data privacy, and others as well. One that we have not talked about yet today is the International Center for Leadership in Education. If you're not familiar with ICLE and their website is leadered.com, and again, each of these is a hyperlink that will take you to their websites. They have some really rich uh, research information for you in their white papers, in their documents around our latest thinking, which includes papers around digital leadership. And so I encourage you to look at that. Uh, also consider some of their conferences and their case studies that are there as well. And then ISTE, which many of you are familiar with ISTE, they've been a leader in this field for a long time. I would ask you to look at their website around the essential conditions of what it is that a district needs to do to implement technology effectively. The ISTE standards, which we all know have, are now in the process of being updated again, so you'll want to stay abreast of that. And if your product fits with the framework for an ISTE seal of alignment, that may be something you want to pursue. Some other resources to take a look at are, let's go, we've got one more here. Emily, I'm going to let you click to the next slide. There we go. National School Board Association and their Technology Leadership Network I encourage you, if you've never taken part in a school site visit, it's worth your learning to do that. 
Uh, they have two coming up this year, one in Delaware in April and one in Sunnyside School District uh, in uh, Tucson in May. Uh, the Klein School District was happy to host a site visit back in 2012. It's a great collaborative experience for both the people in the district and those who participate. The Partnership for 21st Century Learning has been leading this effort again for a long time. Take a look at their framework and the resources that they provide along with Project Tomorrow and the Office of Educational Technology at the Department of Ed that we have already talked about. I'm going to pass over these quickly, but you will find them on the Project Tomorrow website and look at the 10 things everyone should know about K-12 students in digital learning, as well as their infographic on what we should know about teachers in digital learning. And with that, Emily, let's go to our questions, please. And yes. thank you all. <laughs> yeah, you, you covered a lot of stuff there at the end, and um, no one needed to scribble that down frantically. We will be sending out an email with the link to get those PowerPoint slides with all of those great resources um, that Ann has provided. So thank you so much, um, Ann, for all of this today. We do have some questions that have come in, and um, we will get through those as many as we can here in the next few minutes. Um, so the first was in reference to what I think was that first poll, and it's um, in your experience, um, how would you answer that question? What are you seeing as the biggest hurdles for technology implementation? Um, I would say visionary leadership and both of those things. Uh, you know, to have the vision of what this needs to look like, because we're creating something new, it's not something we can go back and say, oh yeah, here was the recipe, here was the prescription. So to vision that in a way that other people can then follow uh, is so important. And I think when I talk about visionary leadership, you know, when we look at the model of our education system in the industrial age, which is what built our public education system, it was so top down and it was prescriptive. And this is how we need to do it. And, you know, if you just tell me what to do, I'll do it and we'll get it done. That doesn't work anymore. So to put visionary leadership in place, it requires high collaboration, and we have to break down the silos. And, and then, of course, money is always an issue, but I think more so the visionary leadership piece and the willingness to change what we've always done. That actually segues nicely into this next question, which is um, what are your recommendations or your experience with how to make the transition between teachers controlling the conversation in the classroom and having students lead their own learning? That's, that's difficult, <laughs> and I, but it's, <laughs> critical. it's critical. And I think that gets to the bottom line is it's the changing role of a teacher in the classroom. And we have to, both in our teacher preparation programs, which need to come along in this journey as well, and in our teacher professional learning communities through PD, we need to help teachers understand that they are no longer the primary deliverer of content. Quite honestly, if all a teacher did was deliver content, we really could replace teachers with computer technology because they can deliver content. What teachers need to do is really embrace the technology as part of their toolkit. I do not see technology replacing teachers in a classroom because to me that relationship between a teacher and student is key. It is the first thing that has to happen in order for student learning to happen. But uh, years ago, there was a saying about teachers moving from being the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. I really think teachers are much more than a guide on the side. I see the role of a teacher today as similar to that of an architect or a designer. And what they are doing is designing learning experiences for their students that meet the individual needs of their students. And they have a tremendous toolkit to pull from to do that. And to me, quite honestly, when teachers can understand that and see how important their value is in that process, then that change can begin to happen. The other key piece is that you cannot mandate this change from the top down. You have to bring teacher leaders into the conversation to begin with, and they have to be able to see it in action through video or visiting other classrooms to really grasp how to do it. And then they need to work collaboratively to make it happen. 
Well, I am sad to say that we have run out of time, um, but thanks, everyone, for participating today, and thank you so much, Anne, um, for all of this wonderful information and taking the time to share it and join us today. As a final reminder, we will be sending out that email later today or tomorrow with a link to access the recording and the PowerPoint slides, so keep an eye out for that. And I just want to let you know that our next webinar is planned for April 13th. We're going to be joined by Gina Falk and Larry Johnson with EdGate. And they're going to give us an update on educational standards, including the impact of ESSA on standards, what's happening with Common Core, and the focus on early childhood and career and technical education standards. Um, so that's going to be another great mm. program. Keep an eye on your inbox um, for more information about how to register for that next week. Um, so one last thank you to Anne, and everyone have a great afternoon. Emily, thank you, and thank the participants as well. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks very much.